Welcome to our 22nd webinar. My name is Joe Cobb. I'm an attorney with Holmquist and Gardner. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube when we're done. So if you uh, want to go back and review it or you need help uh, sharing this after the fact, let us know and we're happy to help with that. Uh, Holmquist and Gardner is a real estate and business focused firm handling all types of matters in real estate transactions and litigation uh, and business as well. We're licensed to practice in Washington, California, Arizona, and a few other states. Uh, today, we're going to talk about 1031 exchanges. And before I introduce our speaker, uh, this is not legal or tax advice. It is for informational purposes only. You should be consulting with your attorney and your 1031 qualified intermediary if you have any questions. Again, uh, we're not giving legal advice or tax advice here, and this is for informational purposes only. Our guest speaker today is Kyle Williams. Our firm has worked with Kyle a lot. We found him to be knowledgeable and someone that we enjoy working with. Uh, Kyle Williams is the Vice President and Account Executive at Investment Property Exchange Services, Inc. Uh, Kyle works with 1031 Exchanges in Washington State. He has 15 years of financial brokerage and real estate experience uh, working in the broad spectrum of real estate issues. Kyle works with brokers, investors, real estate professionals, and residential clients. All right, Kyle, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. I think I'm going to try to turn my video on here. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Great. Great. Uh, thank, thanks again, Joe. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as Joe mentioned, my name is Kyle Williams. I oversee sales in the state for IPX 1031. Uh, we're the exchange division for Fidelity National Financial. So if you work with like Chicago title for real estate transactions, Fidelity, Tycor, like Commonwealth lawyers, there's a whole bunch of others. Uh, we're all part of the same company. Uh, so Fidelity National Financial is a, a very respected, um, very well-known name that, uh, that we're a division of. So we're going to cover the 1031, uh, a, real, a real overview of 1031s uh, from a 40,000 foot level for about 20 minutes or so. Um, everyone's probably going to have some questions because I'll go through everything relatively quickly. Um, so please, if you have if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat or we'll, or send them over to Joe, and we can uh, we can discuss them after uh, after the presentation. There we go, perfect. Uh, there's my contact information. If any of you want to reach out to me directly, uh, feel free to do so. Email. Uh, Cell phone generally work best. So this is a very important slide. And I always start off with this because most people don't know that 1031s are unregulated. Uh, literally billions of dollars have been lost and it's nothing to be afraid of. You just have to do your due diligence. Uh, just like you do your due diligence when you hire a CPA or an attorney uh, or a broker, same thing, but there's just less regulations for us. So there's a lot of great 1031 companies out there. Just make sure that their insurance policies are on their website, they're sufficient for your transaction and, and things like that. Um, as you can see here on the left, uh, the insurances we offer are second to none in the industry, including 30 million of errors and emissions on each account. Uh, so basically we try to over-insure every account so that we never lose a dollar plant funds, nor have we ever, nor will we ever. All right, we can skip through, all right. So one thing here is that our attorneys, we're a disinterested party. So our attorneys can legally never guide you. Uh, so you'll still work with Holmquist and Gardner um, for your real estate transaction. We cannot provide that sort of advice. We will work with them uh, on essentially on your behalf to uh, sort through 1031 uh, uh, legal issues that could possibly arise. They don't always arise in every transaction. In fact, it's not common, but if they do, uh, you'll still work with your, your legal representation. All right. So a 1031 exchange, what is a 1031 exchange? A 1031 exchange allows investors to sell their investment property and use all the equity. That's a key phrase I like to use, all the equity, not just the after-tax equity to reinvest into something bigger and better. Um, at the end of the day, you really just want to do two things, buy for equal or greater value and reinvest your proceeds. Our role is to hold funds in a safe and secure manner. 
Uh, again, as I mentioned, make sure you know who your qualified intermediary is, what their insurance policies are for your exchange. Uh, but one thing that's cool about 1031s is that it's literally the greatest wealth building tool in the internal revenue code. There's nothing else that allows you to buy and sell assets over the course of your entire life and never pay taxes, except with section code 1031. Next slide. So one of the more common questions I get, not the most common, but one of the more common questions I get is uh, vesting issues. You know, Kyle, uh, our corporation, Acme Inc., uh, is on title for the sale of this building. Uh, we want to split up and go our separate ways and purchase as individuals. Can we do that? You cannot. So whatever legal entity is on title, that's who does the exchange. So if Acme Inc. is on title for the sale, Acme Inc. needs to purchase. If I'm on title for the sale as an individual, then Acme Inc., and I'm part of Acme Inc., Acme Inc. can't buy. I would have to buy as an individual or single member LLC, the same tax paying entity. So that's key to remember. If you want to break up and go your separate ways, um, you, you definitely want to talk to your attorney, your CPA, and do that far in advance of the transaction. Next slide. Okay. Yep. Up. Oh. One more. Okay, perfect. So a lot of people think that the taxes on, uh, on investment in real estate aren't high, like 10 or 15%. Rarely does anyone ever say like 25%, but it's not uncommon for us to see clients pay taxes of 25% or more. Capital gains alone is 15 to 20. If you've owned a piece of property around here for any length of time and you and your spouse work, you're probably paying closer to 20%. Uh, depreciation, we call this a hidden tax because a lot of people don't know about it until they've been hit by it. But when you sell your investment property, assuming it's not land and there's improvements on the property, you're taxed at 25% of the depreciation that you take that you took or should have taken. And lastly, we have the net investment income tax, better known as the affordable health care tax of 3.8% on top of that. So as you can see, a 25% collective tax rate, not uncommon whatsoever. So if we look at an example here on the left, where we sell for a million dollars, we cash out, we pay our taxes, but we reinvest at a 75% LTV, buys us 3 million in new property, right? But we paid our taxes. On the right-hand side, the exact same transaction, except we do a 1031 instead of cashing out and reinvesting later. That 3 million turns into 4 million. And transactions like this are not uncommon as any of you can imagine in the Puget Sound area. Uh, so the difference on a million dollars of income, even at like three, four or 5% cap rate, I mean, that could be a million dollars over like 15, 20, 30 years just because you did a 1031 exchange. So again, this is a really good tangible example of why section code 1031 is the greatest wealth building tool in the internal revenue code. Next slide. Uh, like kind property. So one of the most common, if not the most common question I get is, Kyle, I'm selling a, uh, a rental, single family rental. I've heard about this like kind thing. I guess that means I have to buy a single family rental. Not necessarily. You can actually exchange into any property held for business or investment use. Um, a key one that I like to use uh, in examples because this happens so often is raw land. There are so many people that actually buy raw land, sit on it for like 10, 20, 30 years, have a gain in it. And then they realize, you know, what am I going to do? Just sell this property and pay more in taxes? Now, so they can actually exchange into uh, fee simple property like single family rentals where they can get depreciation, they can start collecting an income on it. So if you're a landowner, you know, definitely talk to, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me and I can answer any questions about exchanging into something where you can put that stagnant equity to work. And again, there's, there's nothing wrong with land. It's just a lot of people don't know that they can actually exchange into other things. Uh, 1033. This is eminent domain. Uh, it's starting to pop up a lot around here and it has really for the last couple few years. It seems like it's coincided with light rail, even though that's generally not the case. Uh, but if there's an eminent domain issue, you don't do a 1031, you do what's called a 1033. Uh, but like kind truly means like kind, it's same use for same use. So if you had a, uh, a hotel taken through eminent domain, you would have two years to find another hotel. You couldn't buy like a gas station with it, for example. So 1033 is all self-reporting. Uh, it's something you'd want to work with your CPA on. Next slide. So one of the most common questions, another common question I get is, 
how long do I have to hold this property for? I've heard flips don't qualify. That's true, flips don't qualify. But there isn't an exact time frame that someone needs to hold on to a property for before they can do a 1031 exchange. Uh, some people say, uh, especially tax advisors, will say one year and some rents, you rent the property, you have a business in there and hold it for a year, you're probably going to be okay. That generally means long term in the IRS's eyes. Uh, more conservative CPAs might say hold for two years just to be safe and remove all doubt. So if a client said, if a client came to me and said, you know, Kyle, we've rented out this property for 15 months. Um, can we do a 1031? I would probably say, you know what? It's probably okay, but you'd want to check with your CPA and make sure they're comfortable with it as well. And they probably would be, but there's plenty of conservative CPAs that, you know, I, who am I to overrule them, right? Like they know the clients, they understand the tax code very well. So uh, it just really depends on what your CPA says, but a year or two is probably okay. And really it comes down to intent too. Uh, what's your intent in buying the property? Is it to flip it or is it to hold it long-term for business or investment use? And that, that answers a lot of questions with, can I do a 1031? Does it make sense? Next slide. All right, the nuts and bolts of 1031. Uh, day zero on the exchange, close of escrow. That means your 1031 needs to be set up before close of escrow. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, once a property closes, it's too late to do a 1031 exchange. We have to have everything, and right now with as busy as we are, title and escrow, broker, everyone in the, in the transaction is, we generally need to set up at least a week before closing of your relinquishing property. But from there, you have 45 days to find new property to purchase and 180 days to close. Those two, the identification period, and the exchange period, run concurrently. So after the 45 is up, there's an additional 135 days to close on what you've identified. Next slide. There are three rules to identify. And you can only choose one of these three rules. You can't combine them. But the most common rule that uh, you probably use or that you've heard of is the three property rule. The clients can identify up to three properties of any value to purchase. So let's say that you sell for 800,000. You could identify three properties at 4 million each if you want to. There's no cap on the value, just a cap on the number of properties identified. If that doesn't work, if you want to sell that duplex in Ballard for you know, one and a half million dollars and actually buy like five or six rentals in Eastern Washington and Yakima or Wenatchee, you can do that, but you're over three properties. So you'd go to the next rule. I mean, there's no cap on the number of properties you identify, but it can't be more than 200% of what you sold for. So if you sold for one and a half million, you could identify any number of properties totally up to 3 million. So this might be a portfolio of like seven or eight, $300,000 properties, for example, in that scenario. And lastly, the last rule, I call this the all or none rule. It's a 95% exception rule. Uh, but basically, if, you're, if, if, if you don't want a cap on value, uh, if you don't want to cap on the number of properties you can identify, basically you're going to identify, say, 10 properties at 400% of what you sold for. You want to buy this portfolio, and this is the only rule that works. You have to close on 95% of the value, otherwise the entire exchange fails and you know, your sale would be taxable. So the only time I really see this one is if someone is buying a portfolio of properties and they're just out of the last two. But really the one to remember is the three property rule. And if, if you're in an exchange and you're unsure about identification, you know, call your qualified intermediary, call your CPA, call me, we're more than happy to help. All right, 45 days to identify, 180 days to close. These are calendar days. So Saturday, Sundays, kids, birthdays, legal holidays, whatever you think doesn't extend the 45 or 180 days outside of federally declared disasters. And these are, have to be disasters that you're affected by. Like you live in the federal, uh, in the disaster area, you know, your, your CPA, your tax advisors in the disaster area, you have property that you're selling in the disaster area. So basically you have to be affected by this. And these are not common. I think in the last I don't know, number of years, I've seen like one in Washington state. It was actually in November. It was the, uh, it was like all that flooding in Skagit County. And there was actually a, a, a disaster, a federal disaster extension for 1031s uh, for affected taxpayers within the Skagit County area. So they're not common. People generally can't bank on getting one, but that's the only time there are extensions. There are no other options for extensions.
All right, next slide. All right, reverse exchange. So this is popping up more and more every day. Uh, exchangers will call and say, Kyle, I heard about this reverse exchange thing. Uh, is, it, is, is it as easy as a normal 1031? It is not. So in a normal 1031, clients close on their sale, uh, the exchanger then releases funds to us, and then we deliver those funds when they're ready to purchase. With a reverse exchange, we actually close on the purchase first, we take title of that property, triple net leaves it back to the exchanger, and then they have 180 days to close on their sale. So because we take title to do it correctly, you know, we have to set up a single use LLC. Uh, there can be conforming loans involved like Fannie and Freddie. So you generally need to have cash to do an exchange or hard money. Uh, if it's commercial, commercial lenders, some commercial lenders are okay with it, um, but there's gonna be non-recourse language. Uh, so definitely something that you'd wanna talk to the lender about far in advance. Uh, normal 1031 exchange is a thousand, it's less than a thousand bucks. A reverse exchange would start at like six to 7,000 and could be considerably more depending on, you know, type of property, purchase price, um, you know, the loan involved, uh, things like that. So reverse exchange, we don't ever push anyone, hey, do a reverse exchange. Uh, you know, this is, this is the best option. You know, some people it makes sense. Some people it doesn't, but reverse exchange, you definitely need to do your due diligence on before you decide that's the road you want to go down. All right, the DST, the Delaware Statutory Trust. So this is a really, really neat thing. Uh, DSTs are technically securities, but really it's real property. A lot of people will compare them to REITs, but REITs, real estate investment trusts, uh, are essentially investments in companies that invest in real estate. With this, with a DST, you actually physically own the property along with say, you know, 25 other people. And you're just actually an active, uh, you're, I should say you're a passive uh, party to the transaction in the sense that you don't have to manage that property anymore. You don't have to deal with the terrible T's, you know, termites, uh, trash, toilets, do stuff like that at a, on, a, on a Monday night at 1 a.m. This is 100% passive. They're commercial properties. You might have like an Amazon warehouse. You might have a portfolio of, say, auto zones and Walgreens, uh, but it's 100% passive. Uh, the downside here is that you have to be accredited. I'm sure many of you are accredited, but basically you have a net worth of a million dollars outside your primary residence. Uh, but other than that, uh, DSTs can make a great option if you want to, if you want to exchange into something passive. Uh, DSTs, just like any other replacement property options, are nothing that we're affiliated with, uh, but we can refer you to uh, local groups that actually handle DSTs and can, can give you more information if you're interested. With that, I think we're right about at 20 minutes. Um, Joe, do we want to open it up for Q&A here? Yeah, let's start Q&A. If you have questions, you can type them into the question box and, and we'll try to answer a few of them. Uh, we've got one here waiting for us. Kyle, the question is, uh, what if I purchased jointly with my spouse? and then sell because of a divorce decree, can I use a 1031 exchange only for my half of the gain? Uh, so it depends when the divorce happens. I mean, if the divorce happens in the middle of exchange, there's not really a ton of IRS guidance on that scenario. Uh, it depends on which tax year it falls on, if it's a split tax year. I mean, it's really up to the CPA at that point, but let's just assume that, that you bought a, a rental together 10 years ago and then five years ago you got divorced and you're both still on title, then yes, you could go your separate ways at that point, assuming that um, that you're just on title as, as joint ten or tenants in common. So, you know, you can go one way, your spouse can go the other way and you can do an exchange with your half and they can do an exchange or cash out and pay taxes up to them. Great. Hope that answers the question. Uh, next question we have is how strict are they on the commercial to commercial designation? Like, does it have to be the same commercial use or is it just commercial property? So with 1031s, any type of real property held for business or investment uses like kinds, there's no difference in the IRS's eyes between uh, 
50,000 acres of raw land in Tennessee in the Space Needle. It's the exact same thing from a 1031 perspective. When it comes to 1033 in eminent domain or even condemnation, then yes, same use for same use. So, um, you know, I always give the example, if you have a hotel, you need to buy another hotel. You couldn't buy a gas station, for example. Um, but for 1031, it's not like that. Like kind is very, very broad. Basically anything that's not a flip, personal use or new development to be sold would probably work assuming it's real property. Great. Let's see, we've got another question here. Uh, inner dealings. What are the rules about related party exchanges? For example, could you use a 1031 exchange to buy a property from a family member? Or good questions. Family? Yeah, yeah, very, very good question. And this is one that actually no one really ever asked. So uh, I'm glad it got brought up. Uh, in a related party transaction, uh, you can sell. If, you're, if I'm the exchanger, I'm doing the 1031 exchange. I can sell to my brother, Joe, for example. That's fine. Um, it's not a huge deal to sell to a related party. However, if I'm the exchanger and my brother Joe wants to sell me his property, it doesn't matter if it's a, you know, it doesn't matter what type of property is, one of two things would have to happen. Either A, he pays my tax bill, let's say I'm, let's say I'm deferring $92,000 in the exchange. So he pays that tax bill for me next April, or the other option would be he does a full 1031 himself. And if it's a primary residence, he can't do that. So basically it wouldn't be doable. He would need to have like a rental, some sort of investment property. And he would also have to be doing a full 1031 exchange. So it's easy to sell to a related party. Buying from a related party is a completely different issue. Great. Um, let's see, we've got another question here. And this one goes into the 180 days. So yeah. if the deal goes past 180 days, but both parties still want to continue, what happens? So you, you don't go past 180 days. That's it. These are firm timelines. So like you have to have property identified, which means let us know in writing what you intend on purchasing by 11.59 PM on the 45th day. There are no extensions, but you need to close on your property with it on your purchase within 180 days of closing on your sale. Again, there are no extensions. Uh, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if like, uh, you know, we've seen where someone will identify a property on say day 40. And like 10 days later, you know, there's a fire, arson, whatever the case is, it burns to the ground. They're like, can I re-identify? You cannot. The IRS just doesn't have sympathy if you're, um, if something goes haywire with your identification. The only time you could actually get an extension is if you're directly affected by a federally declared disaster. Great, let's see, we've got one last question. Uh, 1031 exchanges, oh, and entities. So can you purchase a 10, or go through the 1031 exchange and then bring on a partner for a property? Is there a way to make that happen? So, yeah, so there's a couple different scenarios here. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but I'll, I'll go over both of them. So let's say one scenario you want to buy as a tenant in common. Like uh, I'm doing a 1031 exchange on my rental and uh, it's you know $500,000. I'm going to take that $500,000 and I'm going to invest it into a million dollar property. And then Joe, he doesn't even have to be doing a 1031 exchange. He just has $500,000 sitting around that he needs to put to use. And so he'll be the other tenant in common and invest, and so we're 50% owners. Um, but let's say that I buy that million dollar property all by myself, and it's a single member LLC. I probably wouldn't want to change vesting, which means change the taxpayer, until at least a year or two after title, it's, it, until a year or two after the exchange. And that's ultimately up to your CPA, there's not a ton of guidance on it, but um, if I'm a single member LLC and I add Joe to it, it's a completely different taxpayer at that point. It's a completely different LLC. Even though the name is the same, it's a completely separate LLC. So remember I said flips don't qualify. Um, that's basically, you know, that's kind of how the IRS would look at it is that this single member LLC did the exchange, right? They sold and they purchased. And then a month later, it's a new taxpayer on title. That's kind of like a flip, right? So some CPAs are very leery about that. We call that actually a swap and drop where you do an exchange, a swap, and then drop out of a partnership or 
add people as well in this case. So you probably don't want to, you probably want to wait at least a year or two before you update vesting on title, but some CPAs are more aggressive than others and may not care if it's you know, a week later or six months later. It's ultimately up to your tax advisor. Great. And then we've got uh, a few more questions. We'll try and move through them quickly. Uh, the first one is, what if a property identified within the 45-day period falls through before the 180-day close? Can a new property be identified even though you're past the 45-day identification time period? Yeah, so you cannot re-identify uh, after day 45. If you identify on day 20 and find a new property on day 30, that's fine. You can change your identification on within the 45 days as much as you want. But on day 46, everything is set in stone. So it doesn't matter the reason, unless you're directly affected by a federally declared disaster, you're not getting a, an extension and re-identifying. So everything's set in stone on day 46. You need to close on what you've identified. All right, and then we'll answer one last question. Uh, this one's a little bit longer, so let's work through it. So it says, ideally a seller will allow a delay in closing to allow the transaction for an exchange property to take shape, thereby finessing the 45 to 100 day schedule. Is this coordination between parties to manage the time frame not allowed in the IRS code? And if allowed, how often does that arrangement between parties occur? Can you can you share? I want to go a little slower, Joe. Sorry. Sure. And and I think if you, I think you can see the question as well if you click on Q and A. Um, but it says, okay. Yeah. Ideally, a seller will allow closing or allow a delay in closing to allow a transaction for an exchange property to take shape, thereby finessing the 45 and 180 days schedule. Is this coordination between parties to manage the time frame not allowed in the IRS code? And if it is allowed, uh, how often does that agreement between parties occur? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's ultimately up to you. Um, and yeah, some people will do like some exchangers, especially savvy exchangers, uh, they may list their property and do like a 60 day or sooner closing. So like generally, as, as many of you probably know, standard closing would be like 30 days, right? Like you sign a contract with the other party today, you might have, you know, inspection contingency or whatever, but basically, you know, March 31st, you're gonna close you know, May 1st. There's not 31 days in April, but you're gonna close May 1st, it's a 30 day close. So what some people will do is say, you know what, we're gonna close on or before June 1st to give yourself more time to find new property. And that way, if you find a property in three weeks, then good, you could close early. If you need that full 60 days um, to do it, you can do that too. So yeah, you can you can finesse the 45 and 180 days in that sense in terms of when you close on your sale, but that's the only time you could really finesse. And you're not really technically finessing there. You're just you're just getting a longer closing. But but yeah, savvy investors do that. Great, great. Well, with that, we will wrap up. And again, this was recorded and it'll be posted on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch uh, the presentation or the answering of the questions, you can. If you'd like to contact Kyle, his contact information is right here uh, on this slide. And this, again, was not legal advice or tax advice. It was for informational purposes only. Uh, you should consult with your attorney and your 1031 qualified intermediary if you have any questions. Uh, and with that, we'll finish. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.